Hello, I'm Curtis Hartshorn and welcome to our next class on the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. This is class number eight where we'll be talking about the book of Philippians and focusing on the defense of the plain gospel. I know as I'm teaching this class that a lot of people don't like plain. That, that word maybe bugs you. We don't like to live in plain houses or drive plain clothes or, 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 or wear plain clothes or drive uh, plain cars, unless you're a bank robber, I guess. You don't want to draw attention to yourself. But, but when it comes to the gospel, believe me, you want it to be plain. You want to just stick with what the gospel teaches. Nothing pleases God more than knowing that his children have not altered or changed his gospel in any way. And so that's the, the, the thrust of this course. We want to get back to what is the plain gospel? Are we teaching the gospel correctly? Do we understand as we're instructing others in the gospel what we're talking about? And each of these books has had a different area of focus and Philippians does seem to bring out this defense of the plain gospel. Most of us know that when Paul was writing this, he was in jail. And so he has, he's in jail because he's been out defending the gospel. And so he encourages us to defend the gospel. And then under the, this first point, he talks about A, our participation in the gospel, which means also in defending it. So let's, let's get into that. Number one here, it says the gospel is something we participate in continually. Because as he's opening up, and we'll skip the first two uh, verses there of salutation and get right to verse 3, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. This word participation is the word koinonia, where we get our word fellowship. We're in fellowship. We're in fellowship with the gospel. We're participating. We're, we're doing this together. And we do it when? It says from the first day until now. That means every single day for the rest of our lives, hopefully, we are participating in the gospel. And the way we do that is, is not just to get up and say the word gospel every day, but to actually share the gospel, talk to others about the gospel on a daily basis. Unfortunately, so many Christians only talk about the gospel on Sunday. Christianity was never intended to be a religion that was limited to a certain celebration time each week. We do celebrate our relationship with God on Sunday, but all week long we need to be living out, participating in the gospel. We see even number two that it is our duty to defend the gospel as we confirm it. Going on in verse six he says, for I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. We also have a, a duty to defend this gospel, just as Paul did. We think, well, Paul, yeah, he was an apostle. He was a minister. Uh, that was his, his job. That's not why he did it. You can tell Paul defended the gospel because he believed in it. Every Christian should have that same conviction that I need to be out defending this gospel. I need to confirm it. The word confirm here, or confirmation, my translation says, is the word that means to stabilize, to make sure nobody's trying to knock the props out from underneath the gospel, or try to make subtle changes in what the gospel is and what it teaches. We confirm the gospel. We're going to read uh, in verse 16 here in a minute about how I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. This is what we do. We defend the Word of God. We defend the gospel. We defend the truth, which brings us to another point. 
Number three, we defend truth when we defend the gospel. Now that sounds a lot like Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 in our last class where it talks about the truth of the gospel. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5 is another verse that says, similar uh, message here, it says, because of hope, uh, or excuse me, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. And so when we're defending the gospel, we are defending truth. The gospel is truth. Uh, one more point about our participation in this gospel. We see number four that the gospel must be defended against those who preach out of envy and strife. You know, we'll move up here to verse 15. It says, we're still in Philippians chapter 1. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, this is the ones that preach out of envy and strife, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. And so we're defending this gospel. We're defending those uh, it against those who preach with bad motives, who are, who are trying to be, who, who are envious, and that's their motive, or they are uh, preaching out of strife, they're trying to cause trouble. We show people, by our own lives first, that the gospel is not something that you argue about. Uh, I don't, do you know people who cannot discuss the Bible without arguing? Why is that? When Philippians 2.14 says, we're not to do anything with complaining or arguing. We should not be complainers or arguers. We don't argue about the Bible. We show it. We, we display it. And if somebody wants to disagree with that, well, that's fine. You know, that's your choice. But this is what the gospel says. There's no sense in, in getting into a shouting match over the Bible. Our, do, our job is to defend the gospel, but our, our job is not to uh, beat people up with it, to defend it to the sense that we are, are trying to uh, maim those who we believe are in the wrong. We provide the truth, we present the truth, and we do this with every ounce of energy we have, but never are we to be uh, combative or, or hurtful in our presentation of the gospel. This gospel, point B, is untethered. Let's talk about the untethered gospel. It does not have chains on it. Paul had chains on him as he was writing this, but the gospel is never chained up. Number one, it is our responsibility to ensure that this gospel is progressing. Now we're going to back up to verse 12, still in Philippians chapter 1. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Now remember, he's in jail. So that my imprisonment in the course of Christ has become well known throughout all the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Paul says, now, they've, they've thrown me in prison. They've tried to stop the gospel. Do you know what's happened? It's spread even further. There's nobody in the Praetorian Guard who doesn't know Paul was preaching the gospel. You could ask around, did you know Paul? Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> He's talking to everybody, and not just the Praetorian Guard, but, but all those around him. The gospel is untethered. You can't hold it back. You can imprison us. You can, you can try to shut us down with laws or whatever it is. The gospel is untethered. It progresses. The, the real message for us, number two here, is make it well known among those you're chained to, in a sense. What is it that you stand for? Let them know. And we're, but I mean chain, I mean where we, the people we're constantly in contact with. That's who Paul preached to, was who he was literally chained to. He was chained to, to a guard quite often. 
And that was a great opportunity in his mind to talk about the gospel. Well, you have somebody that you are tethered to somewhat, you are uh, attached to. Do they know the gospel? Do they know that you are a Christian and that you love God and that you want them to have a relationship with God? What is it that you really stand for? What is first in your life? If, if Christ really is first in your life, it will come out in your speech and in your behavior. Another thing we learned from this passage, number three, is that fear is a major deterrent to the progress of the gospel. We see this in verse 14. And most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have more courage to speak the word of God without fear. We need to overcome our fear. The, the uh, situation in our world here the last couple of years uh, with the pandemic has caused many to be fearful. And I have had several brethren saying, I, I, I don't come to church because I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't understand the fear. You know, I understand that nobody wants to get sick and people don't want to, to lose their lives. That's, that's understandable. But in the first century church, they also ran the risk of losing their lives on some occasion or being thrown in prison because they went to church or because they shared the gospel and they got caught doing that. There's places in the world today where if you are preaching the word of God and you get caught, you're going to prison or maybe even worse. Fear is there, but really from a biblical point of view, the only thing we should be fearing is God. And, and many of us know that, you know, and I, I don't want to put a guilt trip on you, but, but think about why do you fear these things? And if you fear these things, does this mean you fear them more than you fear God? The solution, I believe, is in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, where it says there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. The one who fears is not perfected in love. And so... If you want to overcome your fear, grow more in your love for God and get it to that point that you are perfected in your love for God. And then these other things that we fear, that, that, that make us uh, uh, frightful and, and tense and uptight, they will fade away the more we focus on our love for God. That's the solution. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. So if you want to cast out your fears, Strive for that perfect love of God. Verse that talks about uh, another way, sometimes we, our fear moves us away from God. Colossians 1.23 says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and in which I, Paul, was made a minister. Don't let fear move you away from your hope of the gospel. Stand firm. Let's talk about the last point here, our partnership in the gospel. This is another predominant theme in the book of Philippians as it relates to the gospel. And point number one under that, we hold ourselves to a certain standard of conduct because we are ambassadors of the gospel. I've talked a little bit about this in previous classes, but I want to revisit this subject. The gospel is something that we proclaim, and in doing so, we are ambassadors of God. Philippians chapter 1, still, <clears throat> look toward the end there, verse 27, it says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We had in our community, we have a, a young man who, he's well known around the community, but he is uh, a slightly mentally disabled, and so he doesn't work, and he, he doesn't, uh, well, he gets teased, obviously, by a lot of the uh, people, but uh, there is a important man in our community that whenever he puts on an event, he hires this, this young man to do some job, take tickets or, or make sure the hot cocoa is passed out or something like that. 
And you should see the change it makes in this, this man when he gets asked to do something that he believes is very important. He, because of, of what he's asked to do, it, it changes his whole demeanor. He, he sees himself as an ambassador to the one who asked him to do this. And, uh, and he, he just has a dignity about him. Well, when we understand that we are the ones who are the proclaimers of the gospel, that should change our behavior too and our conduct. Well, I'm an, I'm an ambassador. I've been asked by God to be an ambassador of the gospel. It should have an effect. Well, I can't be doing this stuff anymore, and I, I need to kind of uh, straighten up here a little bit and, and, and fly right. You know, I need to make sure my conduct is correct. The gospel changes us in a very positive way if we will allow it to. Now, number two, we do not strive by ourselves for the furtherance of the gospel. We stand together by faith. This is something we do together. Verse 27 again, he says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit and striving together for the faith of the gospel. Note the word together. We stand together by faith. And along with that, number three, we stand firm in one spirit with one mind. Imagine that. Imagine a church, a congregation of people, and they stand firm in one spirit and they are of one mind. Now, of one mind doesn't mean everybody thinks the same thing and we never have any disagreements, but it means we're, we're one in our purpose and in our, our uh, direction that we're going as a church. I've never met anybody, I, I don't think, that I agree with perfectly on everything, but I have brethren that I am united with. We are of one mind. I have several brethren that are like that, and they're, they're striving for the same thing I, I'm striving for. And we may, if we talk long enough, we might find little things that we disagree with. But when it comes to the gospel, we are of one spirit and one mind. That's how all Christians should be. We stand firm together with one spirit and with one mind. Let's go on to the fourth point here. We see that we serve Christ together by taking the gospel to our friends and our neighbors. Now we get into chapter 2 a little bit here. Let's look over at verse 19 together. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interest, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his, and he's still talking about Timothy, of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving with his father. I just love this because you can just hear through Paul's tone how much he loved Timothy and how, how highly he thought of him. He says, I'm sending Timothy because I know one thing, verse 20, he genuinely is concerned for your welfare. You met somebody like that before? Somebody who has a genuine concern for your welfare? He cares about you and, that, and how you're really doing? A lot of times in our fellowship, we say, well, how are you doing? And what we expect to hear is fine. You know, sometimes we don't really ask, no, really, how are you doing? How's your quiet time going? Are you reaching out? Are you studying the Bible with anybody that I need to be praying for? You know, how, how's your walk with God? How are you and God doing? I like to ask that question. How are you and God doing today? Be genuinely concerned for the welfare of others. And we take the gospel to other people, our friends and our neighbors. And number five, I've kind of made this point already, but presenting the gospel together gives us a genuine concern for each other's welfare there in verse 20. When we are working together in the gospel, Paul describes his relationship with Timothy like, like a, a son serving with his father, side by side, working together. He says, Timothy served with me in the furtherance of the gospel. 
We defend the gospel, but we also make sure that it is untethered, that it is growing. And then we have a partnership. The gospel brings about close relationships with one another because we're striving together to further the gospel. In conclusion, let me just say, we're here for the defense of this plain gospel. And that's, that is a predominant theme in the book of Philippians. What we're called to do is to stand shoulder to shoulder as we defend what we know to be right and true. And as we're doing that, we're grateful to God that He has blessed us with the precious gospel, the gospel that can impact us personally in a great way, just by knowing it, just by knowing that I'm in a saved condition, I'm in a right relationship with God. That alone impacts me. But then when I grow to to really fully understand the love of God, that impacts me in a mighty way. God loves me. He wants what's best for me. And on a daily basis, that impacts me to want to do things that are pleasing in His sight. Nothing is more pleasing than when you and I share the gospel. Nothing pleases the Father more than that. Boy, these classes are going so fast, and I hope that you are getting a lot out of them. We've got two more classes. This next one is on Thessalonica and the impact of the plain gospel. We're going to look at both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians together and, and kind of see what Paul was writing to the church there in Thessalonica and what he had to say to them about the gospel. Hope you'll be there. We'll see you in the next class.